Tower. We could start down there and we were able to learn D. And I want to tell you about a new writing project for D. Uh, I brought out a special report, a very comprehensive report, that I call How to Survive in a World Without Antibiotics. You see, I think we're not just facing a future like that, and it's time it's already here. We have a lot of resistant organisms for decades, and we've had resistant syphilis and resistant other kinds of sexually transmitted diseases. But now we've got things like zinconacin resistant enterococcus, and of course the one that everybody knows, MRSA, and MRSA, that stands for methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. Now, I don't know if you know, but the MRSA bug is actually north somewhere, and there's another variant of it called community associated MRSA. It's like MRSA. Everyone knows it's just a hospital bug. You okay? you go into hospital, you're admitted, and you catch this ridiculous infection, and then you come out sick of them before you went in. That's hospital stay on the train. Now, but in fact, there's another form now which is prevalent in the community. It's not rare, and it's very dangerous. There is a respiratory form, meaning that you can breathe it in. And in fact, this form is very powerful and very swift, and there are places, there are documented places, of people breathing in the bacterium in the morning and being dead by bedtime that night. And so it began in, you know, within the first 24 hours or so. So, pretty scary. And in fact, I've likened that in my writings to the old days, the medieval days, when we had the Black Death. Do you remember the bubonic plague with its official name, the Black Plague? But it was called the Black Death because people used to break out in black spots all over. But one of its forms was respiratory in, in nature. People would breathe in, literally in spiral uh, bacteria. It went into the lungs, the person would become infected and just simply died, you know, fluffing up from the lungs for a flush and mucus and blood. It was a horrible way to go, but the, the most terrifying part was that it was so fast. And people believe that the nursery line, you know the kids' nursery line, running in the roses? That's a bit like the rose spots that the person gets covered in. A pocket full of posies, well, if you put your hand in your pocket, you're roughly rough, reaching the groin area. And that's where these bee berries were found. Bee berries were the big, big, big swellings like so. Uh, they were called bee berries, and that was what gave them the bubonic plague. But the, uh, the rest of the line, the tissue, the tissue, they all fall down. Uh, it's thought to represent the suddenness and violence of the respiratory form that is breathing and people dying. Okay, what do you think? You may think that that's just been scary, but in fact the position is getting worse uh, by the day, really, and that's certainly a scenario which has already happened to some people. What hasn't happened yet is that the community associated on our side has got loose in the same way, at the same degree as the bubonic plague or black death, but it could happen. Listen, it could be some other completely different bacterium. The bacterium could emerge this afternoon that was resistant to most of the common drugs or all of the common drugs. These, listen, these things multiply every 20 minutes. So in 24 hours, you've got a bucket full of bacteria. And in three months, it could be all over the planet. Things can travel terrifyingly swiftly. It's only a, a question of propagation. It's uh, you know, exactly in other words, carrying the bacteria from person to person is the only thing that will hold it back. We face some very serious challenges for the future. And I want you to write about that. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a regular MD, I'm a properly trained MD, and I know the official story, and I know that a lot of this has been caused by doctors abusing and over prescribing antibiotics. But also, let me tell you, the, the food industry, especially the agricultural industry, you know, it's common practice, especially in the USA, for example, but the USA is not the only funder. Uh, it's common practice to feed animal livestock on antibiotics that supposedly keeps them healthy while they're kept in a place in poor conditions. But of course, the antibiotics get into the food chain. More than that, the, the animals in question become infected, obviously, by definition, they're infected by antibiotic resistant things. Uh, you know, the resistant ones are wiped out, but the, uh, so the susceptible ones are wiped out, but the resistant ones get into the food chain. And really, the agricultural industry has done a lot more to cause this you know, resistant bacteria problem than the medical professionals do. No matter, you know, this is not a question of one blind. What I'm saying is, we are not just faced with a world without an antibiotics. It, it's kind of here now in a way, and it's going to get worse, it's going to get rapidly worse. And you need to know what you can do to protect yourself and to protect things that you know. 
And I've got some great news for you, which is that there are scores and hundreds, in fact, hundreds of ways of beating bacteria. These have been around a long time. It's not something new. Uh, a lot of these successful remedies have been around, but they've got kind of swamped with it. Antibiotic trays. Listen, I, I went through med school in the 60s, and I believe, like everybody, that antibiotics were terrific. And they were, they are, ah, they've saved hundreds of millions, probably billions of lives. If anything deserves to be called the miracle drug, and the, the number one contribution of scientific medicine to uh, health and healing, it's antibiotics. But, you know, the story is coming to mind, as I said. But, but, you know, they did work. So they, they, they kind of just warmed everybody's view. We got lazy. You know, we got careless about dressing rooms. You know, surgeons got careless about their technique. And, you know, uh, it's become a problem. And we now have to face turning the plant back. But it's no big deal if you know what to do. And as I said, there are literally hundreds of alternative, uh, alternative remedies for antibiotics out there. They work then, and they work now. And the interesting thing is that most of them don't create any kind of bacterial resistance. The bacteria stay susceptible to these you know, substances and to this approach, no matter what. So, as I said, I prepared this report. And I call it How to Survive in a World Without Antibiotics. And I've compiled what is, without question, the most comprehensive survey of all the available techniques. Listen, I even begin with simple as soap and water. Uh, it's not as simple as you think, but anyway, anyway soap and water has a place, and I had discussed that, but also uh, simple germ ointment. I mean, today, how many people actually know what a germ cell is? I think I'm over 11 months down, I think most people under 30 wouldn't have a clue what that was. Uh, but it's very simple, it's very effective, and it does away with the need for antibiotics, but probably four out of five times. But there are many other things you can do with like organic, sorry, inorganic substances, chemical substances, I mean, you know, colloidal silver, everyone's heard of that. But you have to know and understand colloidal silver, it doesn't really work. Some of it on the market is rubbish, it wouldn't sell it anybody doing uh, It's possible to uh, inject the strong inorganic acid, in fact, an acid that would burn a hole in your tank if you spill it. Uh, but yes, you can inject people with this, and it produces a tremendous amount of things. I've, I've injected myself twice the latter of the last 20 years. It worked both times. There are no complications or side effects of any kind. Not some story, but you know, hey, if I'm willing to do it for myself, of course I'm willing to do it for patients, and the reason is simply that it works. There are things out of the larder as we go food stocks. I mean, again, everyone knows the garlic story, okay? I've retold the story in some detail, the way you need to know. But look, there's a special kind of honey that actually is spectacularly successful at dealing with you know, skin infections of the MRSA kind. I'm constantly getting feedback from people to whom I've recommended it, but it really works. But there are also herbs, or, and I bet you couldn't guess all the number of herbs that have good science behind them, uh, with, uh, I mean, good science as antibiotic substances. Uh, green tea is pretty good, but did you know white tea has been tested? White tea extract has been compared. So there are, there are substances in uh, green tea and white tea called catechins, and 11 of these are compared to five major antibiotics, including vancomycin. Now, vancomycin is known somewhat as the kind of last ditch antibiotic. If you've got an you know, say there's a chance it might pull you through. If you've got a serious antibiotic resistant infection, Vancomycin might just work, but as I said, we do now have vancomycin resistant organisms too. Anyway, I've found interesting some studies that show the epicatechins and white tea, and white tea extract, were actually better than tetracycline and better than vancomycin uh, as an antibiotic. So here, I've done a lot of the work so I've rounded up the good science that proves, you know, which things work and, and which don't. 